couple of things beforehand. Uh, I was going to pray, I put down on Friday uh, for praying for John MacArthur. And as you, most of you should know, or all of you should know, that there's been a um, victory for him, in part. Um, it's temporary, and he's allowed to open his church tomorrow, as well as Jack and all the others. And you know, the amazing thing is the judge upheld the Constitution of the United States. That is the thing that you have to... And, and if you're wondering why, what the Constitution of the United States has got to do with us, if it falls, we fall. Um, we're, we're protected by, by the glow from that um, document and from the people who live uh, their lives according to it. So there is a full trial um, or, or presentation of the issues on, I think, about September the 4th, somewhere around there. So pray for him that he's going to have favour um, with, the, with the courts and with the um, judges. But can I tell you that um, the, the impetus behind these governors who are trying to shut down churches and let everything else operate is from the dark side. So even though John had that um, uh, success on Friday or yesterday, um, we need to keep praying for him and his protection because the other side never give up. You know, they might retreat for a few days, they'll come up with something else. So keep praying for them, keep praying for Jack and Barry and all the rest of it. Um, and so it really is that critically important that we do that. Now, my wife came up to me um, yesterday and just mentioned something in passing about something that she had just heard online. And, and it was quite profound the way I accepted it. And I'm just paraphrasing it, but there was a man, a Jewish man, who survived the Holocaust during World War II, and in the time shortly after that, when he was wandering around Germany, he hadn't made it out of Germany yet, and uh, he was wandering, wandering around in a rural area in, in paddocks and that, and he saw a guy um, looking like a farmer, just close to the ground with a smile on his face. So the Jewish man walked over and said, what on earth are you doing? And he said, I'm listening to the land sing. I'm listening to the land sing. And don't worry, I'm not getting all Pentecostal or anything like that, but I'm just saying this is what he, told, he said. So anyway, the Jewish man was intrigued by that, so he got down on the, uh, on, on the, near the ground and he listened. And after a little while, he said to the farmer, I can't hear anything. And the farmer said, no, you can't. This is not your land. This is not your land. Not unkindly, but he said, you can't listen, you can't hear it. And so the, the guy eventually made it to Israel. And he went out into country um, um, Israel outside the cities. And he, um, he actually did what the farmer did. And he lay down. And you know what happened? He could hear the song of the land. And he, he said, it's a spiritual thing. You can't hear anything, but there's something that sings in your heart, especially for a Jewish person when he, when he goes home. And that's really a lot of the theme of this morning's message or this afternoon's message. But, you know, it struck me, that little um, story that Sue told me struck me because for the last three weeks, if you've been paying attention, Amir Safati in his weekly and sometimes twice weekly and sometimes three times weekly uh, updates over the last three weeks has mentioned Ezekiel 38 and 39 time and time and time again. And I thought to myself, I wonder if the land is singing to a Jew about what's coming. And I thought that was very, very interesting. And so, um, you know, be aware, be um, uh, watching and being listening uh, for... What's happening um, in the spirit realm? I mean, there's so many things going on that it's absolutely amazing. And we're going to have a look at, um, over the next two weeks, the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. And the thing about this is absolutely fascinating because um, a lot of people say, you know, why, uh, why... And the interesting thing is everyone looks at Russia and Iran and Turkey, and the other ones put um, Libya and Kush Sudan and the many peoples with them. But at the bottom, 
the bottom line is it's a Muslim invasion of Israel. You can't describe it any other way. It is a Muslim invasion of Israel. And so um, if you understand it in, that, in those terms, it's absolutely fascinating. But I want to go to uh, an earlier... Um, I want to go to an earlier um, passage of Scripture now. We're going to go to Ezekiel 36, verses 16 to 23. And then we're going to go back through the, the, uh, through the Bible. So I hope you've got your Bibles in your lap. I hope you've got your f uh, page flicking finger all um, exercised up and warm because we're going to do a lot of Scripture because this is where you get it from. This is where you get the truth from. And so in Ezekiel 36, 16 to 23... This is the um, part of the four-chapter um, section of Ezekiel where God um, proclaims the regathering from 2,600 years ago, the regathering in the 20th century of the nation of Israel. And look at the motive for why God does this. And so we're going to 16 to 23. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, this is Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land... They defiled it by their own ways and deeds. To me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood that they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. So I scattered them among the nations. This is the consequences of 70 AD Tishbiah, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And they were dispersed throughout the countries. I judged them according to their ways and their deeds. When they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my holy name. When they said of them, this is the nations, when they said of the Jews who were living amongst them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they have gone out of his land. But listen, this is the motive. But I had pity, for I've changed it in the other translations it's concerned, but I love the King James. I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations wherever they went. And remember last, year, uh, last week, I, I told you about a, a dinner I had in Northbridge with some Jewish people you know, quite some years ago, and, and without even thinking of the consequences, um, as we were eating this lovely meal, I said, you know, you profane the name of the Lord because you're not living in Israel, and there was this stunned silence, you know, and, and, and so I, I couldn't apologise because it's true, but I just sort of tried to water it down a bit later. <laughs> But they'd still love me and they still love Sue and all the rest of it. So, you know, we got over it. But it's true. The Jewish people were, were destined to live in Israel, but they were sent uh, uh, into the nations of the world after 70 AD. And because of that, a lot of the... Um, we don't understand the, the consequences of that being particularly in Middle Eastern countries where they went to. Because what that... The impact of that on the Gentile nations was that the God that did all of the miracles to bring them into the nation isn't strong enough to keep them in the nation. And that's why the profane of the name comes, the profanity on the name comes. Do you see what I mean? And they don't understand that, quite frankly, it's in the plan of God. This series now is called The Plan of God. And we've got last week Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. And when he offered himself as the king of Israel for the first two years roughly of his ministry, they ultimately rejected him and that rejection is uh, recorded in Matthew chapter 12. So after that, he went into training the disciples for the um, foundation of the church to be prepared for the foundation of the church and they would become the founding pillars and the strength of the church. And so what happened was um, he then took on the office of prophet, and we see Matthew 24 and 25 and everything else that he said pertaining to the future of, uh, of Israel. So for the rest of that time period, he was in the office of prophet. And when he ascended into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, and what office did he then take up? He's our high priest. And when he comes back, what's going to be his office? King. 
prophet, priest, and king, only person who's ever, ever, ever held or going to hold the three, um, the three uh, offices. You and I have a privilege beyond our belief. We are going to be a royal priesthood with him. And, you know, it's amazing. It doesn't matter how many congregations I've, I've stood in front of for the last 23 years, it still staggers me when I look about at all of us and I look myself in the mirror and I think, how did we get this privilege? It's amazing. And it's through the grace and the love of your heavenly Father that we don't deserve it. And this is why Israel's back in the land, why God took pity on his holy name. And that's the underlying reason. Verse 22, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord. Says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. And he gets hallowed in the, nation, in the eyes of the nations of this world because of the outcome of the 38-39 war. It's quite profound and he repeats this time and time again. But to really hit home to us as Christians... I've added another passage. It's Ephesians 2, um, verses 4 to 9, because God does for us what he did for Israel as Christians. And Ephesians 2, verse 4, But God, our Father, who was rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, that's before we even believed, before we even were born, before the foundation of the earth, but when we were dead in our trespasses, spiritually dead, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Notice all the verbs in those passages. All the verbs in those passages are past tense. As far as God, your heavenly Father, is concerned, you're already up there. As far, if you dwell in eternity, there's no yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's, he's already there, and believe it or not, we're there with him. So don't ever come to me, please, and say, I think I can lose my salvation. Because I don't know how, if you go up to heaven, he just looks at you and says, no, you can come back down again. It's, it, it's just not the way God works. Do you see what I mean? And that's what eternity is all about. But he said that, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in kindness towards us. For the same motive that he got Israel back into the land, he gets you and I into heaven. Not because we're goody two-shoes, not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, but because he, towards us, loved us and gave us by grace the opportunity to believe and trust and put our faith in Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross, his burial and his resurrection. We're not here because we're better than anyone out there. We're here because of his grace towards us. And for by grace, verse 8, you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's not one person who's going to be up there with you and I up there saying, well, I was saved because I did this, or I was saved because I said that. Not a hope. God wills it. God does it. God achieves it. Right? Right? That's the background. So they were cast out, but he's restored them for a reason. Now, why is it the land that God gave to, G to the Jewish people? And so we go back to Genesis 15, 18, 21. He repeats the land covenant. I refuse, point blank, 
And I get very upset when I hear commentators call it the Palestinian covenant. It is not the Palestinian covenant. It is the land covenant. You use that word and you feed into their propaganda. You don't ever do that. It is the land covenant. Because I don't see Jesus talking to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and ever mention the word Palestinian. I see the word land. And verse 18, On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. Have you seen the map of, the, of Israel in the Millennial Kingdom? Oh boy, that upsets a lot of people. From the Nile to the Euphrates. And everything in between, over to the Mediterranean, over to the Jordan and the Dead Sea. To your descent, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Did I leave anyone out? <laughs> this is important. Do you see what I mean? Because... To, to people that God was speaking to at that time, these were tribes in the land that he's going to eventually give permanently to the Jewish people. And be careful with that word, give. So he repeats this thing in Genesis chapter 26, verses 1 to 3, and he repeats it to Isaac. In verse 26, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Itzhak went to Abimelech, the king, of the king of the Philistines near Gerar. This is down in Gaza. Then the Lord appeared to him, this is to Isaac, and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands." And I will perform the oath which I have swore to Abraham your father. And he repeats it to Jacob in 28 verses 10 to 14. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. That is from south of Jerusalem. He's turned around and he's walking back up north again. And so he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and he put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He repeated the covenant agreement that he has with the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land is his to give. And he's defined the people who are to live in it. Now, this is the, the, um, the critical thing for us to understand now. Nine times in the, in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, God describes whose land it is. And we go to Leviticus 25, verse 23. The land shall not be sold permanently. Why? For the land is whose? His. His land. We know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness therein. I dislike it intensely when people say that Satan is the God of this world. He's the God of the kingdoms of this world. This planet belongs to God and he's in charge of everything that happens on this planet and everything that happens 
good and bad, is in the plan of God. And it ends up in the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22. And I can't wait to get there. The land is God's. For you are strangers and sojourners with me. And 20 years ago, I listened to a Jewish um, um, messianic believer describe it this way. The Jewish people are tenants in perpetuity in the land of Israel. They have possession of the land as a tenant has a land in perpetuity. Because whose land is it? And you know, the thing that fascinates me and the thing that has fascinated me ever since the covenant with Abraham is how our enemy hates that piece of land. He doesn't hate Western... Well, he probably does, but it's not in the Bible. He might hate Western Australia. He might hate Victoria. You can see why, what's going on. I feel sorry for those people. I feel sorry for our brothers and sisters in that state, seriously. But he hates... The enemy hates that land. Because God, nine times... We'll do another one. 2 Chronicles 7.20. Then I will uproot them from my land, which I have given them. And this house, which I have sanctified for my name, this is a nation Israel, I will cast out of my sight and will make it a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Isaiah 14, verse 25. That I will break the Assyrian, this is in the, in the future, I will break the Assyrian in my land. Even in the tribulation, it's called his land. And on my mountains, I will tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. Jeremiah 2, 7 and 16, 18. I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness. But when you entered, you what? Defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination verse 18 16 18 and first i will repay double for their iniquity and their sin because they have defiled my land they have filled my inheritance with the carcasses of their detestable and abominable gods and ezekiel 36 5 And 38.16, therefore thus says the Lord God, surely I have spoken in my burning jealousy against the rest of the nations and against all of Edom, who gave my land to themselves as a possession with wholehearted joy and spiteful minds in order to plunder its open country. There is nothing new under the sun. There is assault after assault after assault in history against that land. Why? Because it's God's land. Joel 1, 6 and 3, 2. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. I will also gather, 3, 2. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. You don't want to be in this gathering you do not want to be and you don't if you believe and trust in Jesus seriously and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and they have also what Donald I think you should edit your peace plan I think you should edit your peace plan. And, you know, it was very interesting that at the very start of this year, before chaos entered into our realm, I think that Andy and uh, Jim McGowan were doing a, an assessment of the deal of the century. And while everyone was extolling it, these two guys brought up a very salient point that it contains provisions to divide his land. Not a good idea, because it's his, not theirs, not ours, not anyone's. 
let's see what happens. Okay, let's go to the King James Version of Ezekiel 38. And we'll set the stage for today and for next week. It's absolutely amazing. And I have chosen... Um, I got a, a text from Eric. By the way, you should all be, and I'm deeply grateful of this man sitting here. Um, he's not keeping an eye on me. He's, um, we had gremlins last week, if you may have known, and we've got, still got gremlins. Every church that uses this building has got gremlins. But we have a gremlin overcomer. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to work out which commendation in the seven letters to the seven churches of tribulation that he gets as an overcomer but um, I'm sure it's from the Philadelphian one but uh, so that's why he's sitting there and I'm so grateful and he said I'll have to do this and I said that's all right you're just trying to you know grab some of the um, notoriety but I and he said to me he said why have you got um, King James for the first two and the NKJV for the rest of it. I said, because the only, only the King James actually correctly translates this passage. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, isn't that right, Joan? You can always trust the King James, can't you? <laughs> Joan and I had talks about the King Jimmy a long time ago. I love the King Jimmy. I, I just love it. In fact, I'm in trouble now. She's, my wife hates me calling it the King Jimmy, but other people do. Um, the Bible's beautiful. King James wasn't so hot. Um, uh, if you look at the history of King James, it's a wonder he even let them translate and produce a new Bible. But verse 38, verse 1, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, this is Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. Your modern translations have um, uh, you have yeah you have prince of Rosh, Meshech and Tubal. That's right. I was looking around for my um, other Bible. Just hang on a sec. Because. That's wrong, and I'll show you why it's wrong. Have you got the map? Oh, okay. Haven't I finished it? Yeah, I've, I've finished one and two. Can we have the map? Yes. Thank you, Eric. You know I'm grateful. <laughs> the reason why I'm totally against the new translations is because... Rosh is a Hebrew word that has a simplistic meaning. It means head, first, top, most important. And you can search, and I sent this to my um, editor-in-chief yesterday just to get her to check it to make sure that it's perfectly all right. This is the world as it's known to the ancient Hebrews. And you have to understand this because this was at the time that Ezekiel was writing the prophecy. And you can search that map till you're blue in the face and you will never find a place called Rosh. You and I, on the 1st of January every year, celebrate what? No, we don't. New Year's Day. What do the Jews celebrate on the, on, on the, in the New Year? Rosh Hashanah. Rosh the head, ha, the, year, shana. Rosh ha shana is the head of the year, the first of the year. There is no place called Rosh, but there is a place, and I wish I had one of my little pointers. Um, there is Tubal and Meshech. See the Black Sea up there? Okay. Well, if anyone wants this, can you please... Contact me on the website. I'm happy to send this to anyone who wants it because it's absolutely brilliant. Meshech and Tubal are there. And so are the Scythians. The, Scyth the whole uh, area above the Black Sea is called Scyth. But they were there. They had come around from Central Asia 
First of all, the, these are the Scythians I'm talking about. They tried from Central Asia, Central Siberia, to move east towards the coast, towards the Pacific. The problem was the Chinese people lived there. And the Chinese people didn't want the Scythians moving uh, east onto the, into the um, uh, Pacific. So there were several wars and skirmishes and the Scythians kept trying and the, um, and the Chinese kept repelling them. So do you know what the Chinese solution was to this constant um, attempted invasion? The Great Wall of China. Which, and, and I, um, I, uh, Chuck Missler had it on one of his slides in the actual Chinese characters. Do you know what? We, they don't call it the Great Ch uh, Wall of China. Do you know what they call it? The Ramparts of Gog. The Ramparts of Gog. It's to keep Gog out of China. So after the wall, wall was built, they couldn't go east, so they came west. So they came west and they came, from, they, they, they existed from 1,000 years BC to um, 3000 BC in this uh, area, sorry, 300 BC. So they came all the way around the top of the um, Black Sea, down in between the Caspian and the Black, and they came round, and you've got the Madai, and you've got the, um, uh, there's the Arabian Peninsula, and all of these areas here, are the, according to the tribes, that you see in um, Genesis chapter 10. And I think we've got Genesis chapter 10, but I want to just um, turn. It's not my idea, it's not my thesis, it's, it's true. This is an absolutely wonderful study Bible. It's a New King James study Bible, and it's the, the editorial board is led by a guy called um, Dr. Earl Rademacher, and he had a whole huge committee of people, and so did John MacArthur, and so did the AMG, so did everyone who's putting together a good um, study Bible. And so they get a collective agreement on certain passages. So in the New King James, they are not allowed, if they're going to use the New King James, they are not allowed to change the New King James. But they do have this important note in the bottom, um, in, down in the notes on this particular um, passage. And so Earl Rademacher says, Magog is one of the sons of Japheth, whose descendants occupied the lands from Spain to Asia Minor, the islands of the Mediterranean to southern Russia. Some connect Magog with the Scythians, which is true. And they've got this now, this word Rosh, highlighted. And listen what an honest expositor says. There, has been, there have been some expositors in recent years, who have argued that the word Rosh means Russia. However, this is highly unlikely, for usually the Hebrew word means head or chief. The phrase could be read, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. What do you think the King James has got? The chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. Concerning Meshach and Tubal, we also have no knowledge. Well, Earl, you never had this map. And it just shows that all of us learn. There is not one person who holds the whole complete appendium of knowledge in themselves. And so geographically, these two are thought to have been near Magog, which is the, the land of, of what we would know as Russia. And all that is known, uh, is known is that Gog from Magog was the leader over two or three regions or countries loaded, located near the Caspian or Black Seas. And you're more than welcome... So just check that if you want afterwards. But Gog is a fascinating person. And if you accept the King James translation, he's a chief prince. And he's not a good guy. He's not a good guy. And um, how many here um, um, have watched Chuck Missler over the years? Uh, there's a lot of you. We might as well call it the Chuck Missler Society. Um, <laughs> Sue and I got set on fire when we first heard him in Perth way back in, in uh, I think it was 97. Were you two there that night in Churchlands? You were? When he first came to Perth. This is our friends from way back when. Um, John and, and um, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> Look, when you're preaching, 
no wonder they sent me and uh, gave me a form to put down my name because, you know. <laughs> but we've been friends for, what, 25 years, more than that. And, and um, um, Chuck pointed out a very pa particularly interesting thing about this personage called Gog. And if you go to Amos 7.1, and I'm not sure... Yeah, this is the one from the Subturgent. Don't worry about it, just leave it there. If you um, go to Amos 7.1... I might... I'll go there, all right. Because this really puzzled... Um, this really puzzled... Um, um, Chuck. He just couldn't get his, his head around this. And in Amos 7.1, you can work it out if you really try hard. Verse 1 in, in the normal translation... The problem with you and for you and I is that we have in our Old Testament the Masoretic text, which was formalized and finalized in 900 AD. The LXX, the Septuagint, was finalized in 250 BC, so closer to the time that it was written. Do you understand? But in the Masoretic, it says, Thus the Lord God showed me, behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And Chuck used to say, what on earth does that mean? It's actually quite simple because what happens is that um, there is a, a general harvest, a main harvest, and whoever owns the land, the king of this area, gets first choice of the crop that comes off it. But when they've cleaned that all up, there are sometimes late sprouting um, um, plants that come back up. And so it carries on and, and uh, it's one of the punishments on the land. So Amos was saying that there's a bunch of these locusts that are going to eat the second crop. But look what the Septuagint has on this exact same verse. Thus the Lord showed me and behold, a swarm of locusts were coming, and behold, one of the devastating locusts was Gog, the king. Very interesting. Very interesting. Which re-emphasizes the fact that Gog is not a person. He's a spiritual entity from the dark side. All right? And I'll explain that more next week when we do the second, the second uh, chapter. But <clears throat> one of the things you have to understand is that there are ranks of angels. All angels aren't the same. There are ranks of angels. And I looked up a, a guy called Michael Heiser and he's got some interesting comments on, on the ranks of angels. The top rank of angels in heaven are the seraphim. And please don't look at Reformation, middle age type portraits of the throne of heaven where they have tubby little babies floating around the, the, the throne of God with little wings. And they call them seraphim. That's not a seraph. You would be coughing in your chest and say, pardon me if you ever met a seraph. A seraph, apparently with all of the records that we have in the Bible, I'm not interested in weirdo speculation, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in what happens in um, Isaiah um, chapter 6, Ezekiel 1, about descriptions of the throne of God that we're allowed to have. But the seraphs seem to define the area around the throne of God. Just they set the boundaries around the throne of God. The four living creatures are fascinating people because they have four faces on each four living creature. And when you do a study of that, an intensive study of that, it seems to be uh, indicative that God is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent because the qualities that the four living creatures have around the throne, they can see everything, they can hear everything, and they know everything on behalf of God. Do you see what I mean? That's speculation. It's not doctrine, it's a thesis. I, think, I like it. Then you have the next rank down, the cherubim. And the cherubim are fascinating for one reason and one reason only. Who was the boss cherub? 
Ezekiel 28, he was called Lucifer. And God called him the anointed cherub. He was the one in charge. And he, his wisdom, his whole personality and everything was corrupted by the splendor of his beauty. And he, for however long it took, got sick and tired of being the foreman. He wanted to be the boss. And you'll read in the famous five I wills in Isaiah chapter 14, where he says, I'm going to raise my throne above the heavens. I'm going to rise above the, the um, stars of heaven, the angelic realm. I'm going to ri rise above even the Shekinah glory of God. And I'm going to place my throne on the mount of the north alongside God. And I will be like God. What happened? He got cast out of heaven. Don't you find it amazing that one of the most powerful creatures that God ever created sinned and fell, fell that way because he wanted to be like God and he wanted to be seated on a throne around God? Where are we in Revelation chapter 4? We're sitting on a throne surrounding the throne of God, the 24 elders represented of the church. Can you believe that us, I wish I could give you a group photo, we have a privilege that he lusted after. We get to be there and he doesn't. And his fate is set. It's at the end of the uh, Revelation chapter 20 and we'll do that later on. But this is, uh, uh, then up after the cherubim come a group of uh, angels called the archangels. And people will say to you, there's only one archangel. I choose to disagree. Uh, and I'm sorry, he's going to kill me. I didn't put this verse in. Can you get one if I tell it to you? Okay, Daniel chapter 10. And I think it's uh, about three. So if you look up Daniel and chapter 10. What's chapter 10 famous about? Chapter 10 is famous in... Um, in, uh, in prophecy because it contains mentions of uh, ranks of angels that try to stop, or in fact they do delay, Gabriel coming to give Daniel a prophecy. And we have the prince of Persia who was obstructing the angel Gabriel from going to Daniel and giving him the next prophecy. And... Um, uh, where it is? Uh, there he is. And dun -dun 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 -dun. There he is. Thirteen. No, thirteen. Go way, 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 way back to thirteen. Ten, thirteen. Good try. Good try. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. So the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days. And behold, Michael, watch this carefully. In your translation, it says one of the chief princes. So there's more than one. But one in the Hebrew there means first, not one. One as a number one, numero one, but he would seem to be in the Hebrew the head of the archangels. Now don't go saying to someone else, I listened to some guy on Sunday and he said, you know, he's been reading the Apocrypha and there's all these other archangels. I'm not reading the Apocrypha, I'm reading the Bible. And so it has it here that Michael, one, the first, the chief among the chief princes, came to help me, for I, I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. And so Michael was able to defeat the prince of Persia and allow Gabriel to go and finish his, his mission. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. Because there's spiritual warfare going on where you and I can't see. But I'll tell you what, sometimes we can feel the consequences of it. You ever had a bad day? 
you ever had a bad day? And so he gives him this prophecy. And then in verse 20, he says, Gabriel says to Daniel, do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia on the way back. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. At that time, Greece wasn't even an empire. It was just a bunch of rough tribes um, down in, 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 in that lower area in the Mediterranean. So that gives us a glimpse. Don't go writing theological doctr doctrines based on that, but there is something going on that we need to be uh, aware of. And so when, uh, I, when I saw that, and when I saw the def definition of Gog in, um, in verse 2 of Ezekiel 38, I thought there's something here. He's the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. And do you know why Meshech and Tubal? Because that's where the Scythians, that's where some of the Russians were located at the time that Ezekiel was writing this prophecy. Do you see what I mean? And that's why people say um, they try and bend this and, and, and twist it to, to meet up with modern realities. This is two and a half thousand years ago. And in order to understand it, you have to understand where everyone was two and a half thousand years ago and who was there. And if you go to the Table of Nations in um, chapter 10, verse 2, um, I think I did that one, didn't I? Oh, a win. <laughs> Poor old, old, old uh, Eric on a Saturday night, I give him a list about that long, you know what I mean? He is the the most patient person, he's never yet got angry with me, but I'm waiting, but, <laughs> but he hasn't. So 10 verse 2, now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, and, Han and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. And the sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Yavin, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. No Rosh there. In fact, you can search the scriptures with a microscope and you will only find Rosh one other place. And it's in Genesis 46, verse, I think, 2 or 3, where it lists the sons of Benjamin. And one of Benjamin's sons is called Rosh. But that makes him a Semite not a Gentile. Do you see what I mean? You've got to be very careful to read that he's the son of Benjamin. And so he was still um, a person, not a place. You can search every ancient map you can find and you will not find a place called Rosh because it's a Hebrew word for fir first, um, um, top, head, um, whatever. And you know what? I, get, I got really quite ticked off when I heard someone say earlier on, well, Rosh sounds like rosh -ah, and it doesn't. It's Russia. And, and, you know, Sue's been there four times. I've been there twice. Um, none of them call it rosh -ah. It's Rusia. It's got nothing to do with it. And anyway, that's just... I, I get these little things because it's not in the scripture and let's carry on in Ezekiel 38 and we're down to verse 4 and I will turn you around this is Gog and you've got to be careful not to attribute certain doctrinal or biblical truths to whoever is on the world stage at this time and Putin looks like it, but he doesn't have to be it. Do you, do you know what I mean? Because whoever is in power when um, these, these coalition of countries are joined together on the northern border of Israel, Gog will be running the whole show. It's a spiritual attack against God's people and God's land. And he says, I will put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army your horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields and all of them handling swords. 
And please remember, this is written 2,600 years ago. He's writing in terminology that people could understand at that time. Verse 5. Persia, we know as uh, Iran. Ethiopia, it's really... Um, in fact, Ethiopia... Oh, that map's gone, but um, if you want to have a look at it, it's really uh, Nubia, which is black Africa, which includes the Sudan, Eritrea, and those uh, regions. And you have Libya, which is put. Um, and the, the thing that people, people, when they're defining maps of the nations that are going to attack, Libya, put back then, was never the, the nation that we have now. Put was really the north coast of Africa, from the border of Egypt all the way through to uh, Morocco. And if you're as old as me, you will have gone to high school many decades ago, and they would have taught you geography, and that area was called the Maghreb because it was one continuous strip of countries that when the European empires left Africa, they left artificial divisions in that area. But it is, in fact, the Maghreb. And if you want to know where the Levant is, the Levant is from um, um, eastern Egypt all the way up to the border of Turkey, including mainly um, Lebanon. And the Levant and the Maghreb are very interesting um, places in biblical prophecy. And so we have Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer... Uh, and all its troops, the house of Tagama. Gomer is, is um, as far as we can put it on that ancient map, it's actually the area of Galatia, where Paul was ministering in the first century. Um, I've heard some people go as far as eastern Germany. I can't see it in the ancient maps, but look. It looks like Gomer, according to that map. Uh, to, sorry, Galatia, according to that map. The house of Tagama, which is the Armenian people, and they still, as far as Chuck uh, mentions, that they are still called themselves today the house of Tagama. And it also includes Turkey, parts of Turkey, and uh, Turkmenistan. And all its troops and many people are with you. Prepare yourself, verse 7, and be ready. You and all your companies, that's the named nations that are gathered about for you, and be a guard for them. Now, what is it to be a guard for them? In the Hebrew, it is you are their guide, their counsel, and their supplier. And who's supplying all the arms? Down to Syria, to Lebanon, Hezbollah, Iran, who's sending all of their arms and munitions there at the moment? In fact, the mayor was just saying a little while ago, um, that what we don't understand is that one of the reasons why um, Putin pushed into Syria was to give them the uh, warm water port of Latakia on the Syrian coast and they've been bringing ship, Russian ship after Russian ship after Russian ship with armaments into that area. And I'll explain why in a little while. So all of the, uh, all of the armaments, not all of them, but most of the armaments that they need for this attack are already in that area. The only thing that I don't know that's there, and is mentioned in um, Ezekiel 38 and 39, are nuclear missiles that are aimed at Israel. Because there is a special cleanup crew that is trained to look at the remnant armaments on, in the land at that time, and also the people that have been killed by certain things that they are not even allowed to touch them. They have to put a marker in the ground and they uh, have to call on specialists to come and deal with the deal. But we'll look at that when we get to it. But it's fascinating. But the thing that you have to uh, um, uh, work out as we go through these verses is that there's a massive prepared army on the northern borders of Israel to attack Israel and what do we see in this passage? One of the frightening things, and I, and I studied this, started studying this 25 years ago when none of these nations were of any importance. And the thing that fascinated me even back then is where is the United States of America? 
And here's another thing that no one has brought up except just recently. Where's China? China is pushing to become the world's superpower. And it's still moving forward in that direction, although the hand of God, the hand of um, um, punishment is on that nation. If you follow um, what's happening in China at the moment, the floods, the famine, the locusts, um, amazing things are happening that our news media are not allowed to tell you. Why? Because Chinese companies pump a lot of money into our media. It's disgraceful. You know, there was a time, Sue and I were talking about this the other day, when we were kids and the news always came on at 6 o'clock at night and I'm talking about the late 60s and I'm talking about the days of Walter Conkrite in, in, in the US. You could trust that man. What he said on the news, Walter Conkrite was, was a fantastic guy. You could trust what the news said. Now... We turn it off and we go to YouTube and watch someone else. Why, why would you bother? The first thing is, <gasps> COVID again. Fear, fear, fear. We've got to wear masks. We've got to wear masks. They're getting us ready for a time that is coming. We may not be in it, but they're training the entire world population to be getting ready for total submission to a group of elites who are going to be running the world. And they're practicing now. Even John MacArthur had to concede that all of his congregations have agreed to wear masks when they meet tomorrow, our time. When I, when this COVID thing first came at the start of the year, March, April, because I was immunosuppressed because of my chemotherapy last year, my doctor and my hematologist said, you should wear a mask. So like a good boy, I put a mask on. Well, after about an hour, you get giddy and you, you know, you're not quite sort of with it. Why? Because you're breathing in your own carbon monoxide. Give me a break. It's like putting a hose on your exhaust pipe and feeding it back into your car. And they say that's healthy? Anyway, I'm not going to tell you to wear them or not wear them. That's your choice. But I didn't feel well wearing one. I'll tell you right now. So verse 8, and after many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword. This is the Israelites. And gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. And they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. This is the um, um, Jewish people in Israel. And there are some prophetic guys are trying to say this is not yet and yet um, Amir Safadi says you can go anywhere in Israel. There are no walled cities like was in the time of Ezekiel because every city and every town had walls around them for protection. So you can go up and down Israel and go to any town, Tel Aviv, um, up in the Galilee where Amir lives. Sue was in Beersheba. Um, um, in 2014, she could walk all around the whole area. She went to Hebron for a wedding. No fences, no barriers, no nothing. And so Amir is, is um, of the opinion that this condition has already been met in, um, in Israel. And you might go to some places in the, in the uh, West Bank, Ramallah, Bethlehem, where it not be, may, may not be safe for a Western Christian to go, but they're not walled. Do you see what I mean? So this is happening, and, and it's, it's absolutely amazing. And in verse 9, he says, And you will ascend like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many people with you. I'm going to try and get through to the kicker for today, and I'll keep reading. Thus, verse 10 says, The Lord God, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. And you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder, to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock, goods, and dwell in the midst of the land. 
You know, I've been looking for motive from this coalition of nations for 25 years. And I was looking at um, religion and I was looking at all the other things. Do you know, and I'm sure you're aware, if you've been following the news, Russia, Iran and Turkey are broke. They are seriously broke. They are in financial turmoil. And if there's one thing that's going to stir them into action, it's financial collapse. And why Israel? Look at this, uh, 25 years ago, you had a few farms, you had a few flower gardens, you had a few fruit trees. Now they've got untold amounts of gas, huge amounts of oil, they've discovered gold on the Golan Heights, they've got everything that is described in here, and guess who wants it? Those who haven't got it. So the motive may even be economic. And Sheba and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, will deal with Tarshish next, next uh, um, week. And all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold and take away livestock and goods to take great plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come out from your place out of the far north. That's where the Magogians, that's where the Scythians, that's where the Russians are now. You and many peoples with you. All of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. The whole point of the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war is for one reason, is to get the whole world to focus on Israel and then to learn a devastating lesson that the God of Israel has come to their rescue. The God of Israel, not the army of Israel, not the people of Israel, not the allies of Israel. They're not here. It's the God of Israel that saves Israel. Thus says the Lord God, verse 17, Are you he of whom I have spoken in, my, in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days, Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel, that I would bring you against them? Verse 18, And it will come to pass... At the same time when Gog comes into the land of Israel, says the Lord God. Now, this is, this is something you don't want to be anywhere near. When my fury will show in my face. For verse 19, you don't ever want to be around God when he is furious. We want to stand well back behind him and let him complete his work. And verse 19 and 20 is where we're going to stop because this is the fascinating thing. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. There's a colon there. That's a statement. And then we have to look at what follows that statement. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. A great earthquake. That word great in the Hebrew has a fascinating, there's about three meanings, but they're all sort of like sudden, um, um, devastating, but there's another word that fits with this word in the Hebrew. It's rolling. Who here ever lived in a land where um, um, earthquakes were frequent? <laughs> Believe me, you can handle a quick a quick earthquake, it's, you know, and, and something happens. A rolling earthquake, you're in trouble because it's like a series of waves. That, and I have seen our roads like the, the, the waves of the sea. It's terrifying. And do you know what else it is? A quick earthquake doesn't cause anywhere near the damage that a rolling earthquake does. And for years I was looking at 
How is Israel rendered helpless in the face of this onslaught? Because nowhere in 38 and 39 do you see Israel fight back. And they've got no allies. And I was thinking, how, Lord? And so he said, read 19. And the consequences of 19 are in verse 20. So the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens. Don't forget, they've got nuclear-armed submarines. And I'm always wondering why. Well, why couldn't they fight back? But God includes every possible facility that Israel could use to fight back. So look at this. So that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, that's the air force, possibly, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. Look at this. Listen to this. The mountains themselves shall be thrown down. The steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground in a great rolling earthquake. And I suspect that that's going to destroy totally the infrastructure that Israel has in the land. It'll destroy airports, it'll destroy roads, it'll destroy port facilities, it'll destroy everything. And you're thinking, why? Because God and God alone comes to the rescue. And in doing so, he will be hallowed in the sight of the nations when he alone saves Israel. And that's the whole point of this war. All of the other wars that I listed last week, right from the War of um, um, Independence in '48 all the way through the Suez, the Six-Day War, the Yom Kippur War, the uh, um, Lebanon War, all of those were people trying to... Um, constantly attack Israel, but not hugely prophetic. But this one, this one is prophetic. Why? Because God alone saves them. Not the United States, not the army of Western Australia. Seriously? Next week, we'll get into some of the technicalities that explain what's going on, and it's absolutely amazing. Um, it's absolutely amazing because some of the terms that Ezekiel uses and he, and he um, uses uh, phrases from Jeremiah that indicate that the um, swords and the, and the shields and the bows and the arrows, um, I'm not going to spoil it, but it's amazing. Our God is an amazing God. And you know what? The whole point of us looking at this passage, A, it's going to come. A, I believe it's right on the threshold. I think we're nearly there. And the reason why I, I, I mentioned that singing from the land is because Amir thinks it's nearly here. And if, you know, if, if nothing else, he's a Jewish believer who loves that land. And I think he knows that something's up. But this God who sovereignly saves Israel with no help reached down from the throne of grace and picked every one of you up from the miry clay. He reached down and he rescued you. This God rescued you, rescued me, rescued her. And he did it by sending his son to take our place, to bear our penalty, so that he would be able to give us eternal life and be in his presence forever. This is what this God has done for you and I. And never forget it. Father, I come before you this afternoon and I just thank you for such a sense of, sense of fellowship and, and being together 
and, and studying your word, reading your word, and looking into the future to see what you have already planned in the plan of God. And Lord, I know that your son, Jesus, my Savior, is seated at the right hand of your throne right now, and he's looking down at every one of us, Lord, and he's interceding for us. And he has loved us with a love that we cannot imagine when he hung on that cross. And he died, and Joseph of Arimathea and Rabbi Nicodemus buried him, put him in the cave, and on the third day he rose again, which is our guarantee of our eternal life in his name. So, Father, I'm in awe of you. I love you. I just can't wait to be with you. But in the meantime, Father, maybe we be, we be about your business, sharing the gospel, sharing the good news, fellowshipping with one another, encouraging one another as we see the day approaching. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.